Sandra here, the Vintage Arcade Gal, and it's been a hot minute since I've made a video. Um, for those of you who read my blog or, or whatnot, you know, I've been back in school as the world's oldest college student. But anyway, uh, despite the workload with school, I've still been working on some arcade game projects over the last couple of months. And I want to show you what I did a while ago before it got cold up here in Seattle was we made a portable paint booth I'm really really excited about and this was to finish the restoration on our red Donkey Kong which is like 99% finished um, the only thing that's not done with it yet is the coin door and because of the COVID situation currently um, all the places to powder coat these things are closed but we're gonna take a look at it anyway and take a look at the paint booth and how I made it um, I think it's a pretty good way to go about uh, if you need a portable paint booth if you're painting a full-size cabinet, it makes it a lot easier. Uh, the second thing we're going to look at is there's a new game in the collection, and I know I said I wasn't going to buy any more this year, any more projects, but uh, things happen. It was just it was too interesting to pass up, even though it's getting pretty crowded and up here in the arcade and even downstairs in the warehouse. There's a lot of stuff, but it's a pretty cool game. It's another Atari game. It's definitely not one you see very often, so we'll take a look at that. First, so let's take a look at our mystery game. All right, so here is the new addition to the arcade. It is obviously a Black Widow by Atari. And I always hesitate to use the word rare when dealing with collectibles because I think that's overutilized. But let's just say Black Widow is definitely less common than most games, even most Atari vector games. And Black Widow has a really, really interesting history. Originally, it was developed as a game called Toland's Web. Now, those of you with a nerd PhD know that that is the title of an old Star Trek episode, the original series with William Shatner and Leonard Nimoy. And Atari had decided during its development that they were going to turn it to an Atari Force themed game, just like Liberator. And if you watched our documentary on Liberator, you know the Liberator, wah wah, it's kind of a flop. So, they decided not to do that with Black Widow, obviously, at some point. I don't even know how they would really integrate the Atari Force theme into this game, but I guess they had a plan. Anywho, in 1982, another game came out earlier in 82, uh, another vector game called Gravatar. And Gravatar's space theme game was Atari's attempt to make a more difficult, challenging game, like a player's game, much like Williams, Robotron, or Defender, but it didn't go over well. Uh, operators were upset that the falloff for profitability of Gravatar was pretty fast as players felt like it was just too difficult. So to compensate for this, they released Black Widow as a conversion kit for Gravatar, and Atari actually used the unsold Gravatar machines still in their warehouse and turned them into Black Widows at the factory using these conversion kits. So if you got the kit, what you got was to turn your Gravatar into a Black Widow, you obviously got a new marquee, got a brand new control panel with these two eight-way sticks, and you got some ROMs for the board. The board is still a Gravatar board, these things, and a couple other small patches on the board. And then you also got new side art that you just put right over top of the Gravatar artwork. And then you had a, ta-da, a brand new game. And Black Widow is kind of an interesting combination of a Robotron type play because you have a stick where you move and a stick where you fire and also it's a little bit like the game Bubbles by Williams where you kind of scoot things into the center or off to the edge of the web. I love this game. I think it's fun. Um, they probably made about 1500 kits and conversions at the factory all together. It's really hard to say with this one how many of them were out there but you know, Black Widow also didn't get like a home release. It didn't show up on the 2600 or the home systems or anything. Although you do find it a lot of times in more modern collections of Atari. So let's play it real quick. I'll kind of show you uh, what's going on and how it plays. All right, so we have our game. We're going to play real quick, just kind of a throwdown game. We're not going to go too crazy. So when you start the game, like a lot of Atari games, you can choose what level you want to start off with. So we'll just start, we'll start at level five. And then you play this little spider, this black widow. 
what you do is you shoot the bad guys and get these little dollar signs. Sometimes you can't shoot. And then you progress. And then of course different enemies do different things. And the longer you let those little dollar signs hang out, the fewer points you get from them. And what you have is kind of neat of these little barricades in here. And sometimes they're red. But see, if they're red, you can't go back out. And if they're green, you can go either way. And these become important a little bit as we go. And here's the bonus round. A lot like Galaga or uh, Gyrus. In between, now, these guys with bomb grenade bugs will blow up everything on the screen, including you. So now we have an egg, so we want to take that egg and push it, push it off, or push it in the middle. And like any of these games, you know, it gets pretty intense as it goes along, and there's a new series of enemies. So that's pretty much Black Widow. It's not the most innovative game in the world, but uh, it is a lot of fun to see we get a grenade. And uh, it's a good use of vector, I think, because it's very fast-paced, very colorful, and very exact. So we have been restoring and repainting bits and pieces of arcade games for a very long time now. Repainting something small, say like a coin door or a control panel, is not a big deal. Painting a full-size cabinet, however, without the aid of a controlled paint booth can be a little more difficult. In the past, when I've decided I needed to paint a cabinet, I used what they call a dry roller technique, and usually I got pretty great results. But with the number of current projects in my workshop needing a full coverage repaint, I thought it was high time and long overdue to invest in a spray gun for painting. Now this also meant it was time to fabricate some sort of paint booth. My Donkey Kong red cabinet was the perfect candidate for a spray gun paint booth repaint. It had been heavily damaged over time with gouges and scratches and it required a good bit of bondo and sanding to get it back up and going again. I also wanted to closely as possible match the original painted red laminate smoothness and luster. With my perfectly matched oil based paint ready to go, it was time to revive my barn fine Donkey Kong back to its former raging red glory. Painting with a spray gun has some distinct advantages, mostly in consistency with the application of the paint. Paint guns can also have a few disadvantages. They can be a little finicky to use. They're kind of a pain in the butt to clean up and they can be expensive. They can also be kind of fussy about the types of paint you utilize in them. The biggest challenge when using a spray gun is they, well, they kind of spray paint freaking everywhere. So. In any area you happen to paint, you're going to get particulate of the paint in the air and it's going to get all sorts of places you don't want it to get to. Compared with say a, like a can of spray paint, which is very limited in the force and breadth in which the paint is propelled, spray guns are very powerful and can push much more paint through the nozzle in a much shorter period of time. Spray gun painters have come a long way in the last 10 years or so. Newer models no longer require air compressors and are actually pretty good for light to medium duty work, like say painting a small piece of furniture or an arcade cabinet, of course. I did a bit of research before buying one. I ended up with this kind of air compressorless Wagner model, which was well rated, uh, had the ability to use oil based paints, which was a big plus um, and it said you didn't have to thin them but we'll get back to that in a bit. Uh, the lack of an air compressor was a positive for me since I wasn't gonna be painting a large area like say like the side of a house and I wanted to have free reign of movement while painting. There are two nozzle settings and up to 10 power settings on this paint gun and overall it was pretty well made for the price that I paid. I think I paid a little bit under $250 for this Wagner. I've seen a number of do-it-yourself paint booths online and various blog posts from both fellow arcade game collectors and people who are into other crafts like woodwork. Often they involved either constructing a permanent shelter of some kind, which wasn't going to work for me, and sometimes they use PVC piping and plastic to make a booth, or they even sell kind of these pre-made half-tent style devices um, that are mostly always open to the elements. 
you know, a permanent shelter was just going to be too expensive and too big of a waste of space and it was just overkill for my needs. The PVC piping constructed paint boosts are interesting, but they're too hard to break down and reuse later without a ton of ha hassle. Uh, also, I felt that the PVC boosts look flimsy and the materials needed to make one could cost around $300. Those little half open tent sided spray booths are really meant for small items and they wouldn't work for an almost six foot tall arcade game. Plus, I really wanted to be able to paint the game with no possible intrusion of flying doodads in the air messing with my sweet new paint job. My big idea was to buy a cheap pop up walled canopy online. You know, this is the kind of thing you see often at like a farmer's market or a craft fair or something. And I needed one that met a few criteria. First of all, it had to be cheap. Uh, it also needed to have four walls. I wanted two of the walls to have screened windows that I could open and close. Uh, needed to be really cheap because I'm a cheapskate. It needed to be tall enough and big enough for I could walk around and then walk around the game. It should be easy to put up. It should be easy to store later if I want to use it for other projects. And again, just to reiterate, I wanted it to be super, super, super cheap. So I found my prize on Amazon, of course. It was an above rated canopy with a nice wheeled bag that you could store everything in and it cost about $140. Uh, it came in a couple different colors, but I chose white because I felt like it would be easier to see what I was doing with a white canopy inside than like a bright color. The shipping was free, of course, and it was the next to cheapest one they had on Amazon. The reviews had some complaints, uh, mostly dealing with the fact that the structure couldn't deal very well with heavy winds, but this wasn't really a concern with me because I wasn't going to be keeping up, but for short periods of time. Some other issues addressed were that the walls did not perfectly line up with the edges uh, when you put it together, but this was easily solved with some $10 duct tape from Home Depot. I would also use an oversized heavy duty tarp for my floor base, which is about $20. I bought a cheap fan for 15 bucks and a cheap air filter for 12 for the two different windows. Now, if you don't already own one, if you're doing this at home, you'll also want to invest in some sort of ventilator while painting. Also a full body paint suit cover. Uh, these are often disposable and very inexpensive. I bought one for $15, um, but if you're careful, you should be able to get a lot of uses out of it, even though it's very thin, almost paper-like material. Um, I was able to get some decent use out of it and a face shield for 20 bucks or so. I also used an LED light from my shop to hang at the top of the canopy just to make it easier to see. Uh, I don't have the greatest eyesight in the world. Uh, I would also recommend using some sort of nice heavy duty latex gloves just so you don't get paint everywhere. It's also a lot easier to clean up the paint gun afterwards with some gloves. And also some sort of paint thinner will help you clean up and help you thin the paint out if you need to. The canopy itself is pretty easy to assemble and actually I thought it was fairly well made for the price. It's much easier to put together if you have two people to erect the tent, but you could do it solo if you're pretty crafty. The folding metal structure was definitely not the sturdiest thing I have ever seen in my life, but uh, it was fine for the purpose. One of the big highlights was that nice heavy duty bag where everything fit very nicely into it and it had these great big chunky wheels on the bottom to kind of roll it out of the way into the workshop when I was finished with it. The sidewall is simply adhered by Velcro to the metal structure or the skeleton of the canopy. And honestly, they could have used a few more Velcro tie down points for sure. The non windowed walls had a zipper opening in the middle for an entry, kind of like a tent. And on the ground before I assembled the canopy, I put down my heavy duty tarp and I used bricks to hold it down just in case it got a little bit windy, which it tends to sometimes around here in Seattle. Afterwards, we built the canopy up right underneath kind of my garage overhang. Any gaps I was concerned about where the walls lined up, uh, I just used duct tape or some heavy duty clamps to kind of make sure paint didn't escape. Uh, one window I had closed uh, via the very cheap zipper enclosures while painting. I would open it up and let the fan blow in when I was done painting and I wanted to dry. The other window uh, was always open, but I put the air filter with a piece of cardboard and later plastic because the carpet ended up falling down some duct tape to allow a ventilated blow through. Any gaps in the window with the air filter, of course, I just used more uh, duct tape and it seemed to be fine. Uh, the paint gun I purchased, I carefully read all the instructions twice and I used the handy, came with like these practice painting shoots that um, 
you just put water in the paint gun and kind of spray them. It seemed like I was pretty much ready to go. Uh, the cabinet was as prepped to paint as I could possibly get it after several rounds of Bondo and sanding and I made sure it was nice and clean, uh, wiping it down. Uh, with some Windex, which I always like to do, just to get rid of any particulate on the cabinet. And I masked the parts that I didn't want to be with painter's tape, cardboard, and some clear protective plastic, uh, which is always a good thing to have kind of hanging around. The first round of painting, I, I was careful to stick to the recommendations of the manufacturer of the paint gun sprayer. The instructions stated it was not necessary to dilute oil-based paint and recommended a moderate setting for the spray gun. Uh, I got into my painting equipment and I made sure the paint booth was hole free and I kind of just went for it. I was careful to stay about six to 10 inches away from the surface as what was recommended. And I used a controlled side to side painting, much like I had done in the past uh, with success with cheap spray paint and even with like dry roller stuff. After the first painting go around, I wasn't super happy with the results. I'll be honest with you. The finish was pretty heavily textured and inconsistent despite mixing the paint very well. After the cabinet dried, which uh, I usually want to give about 48 to 72 hours with oil-based paint, I sanded the cabinet with a wet sand uh, just to get the rough spots down and then I gave it another go. On progressive rounds, I was much more successful on the lack of pebbling and I was much, much more satisfied with my results. This was because of a few changes I made in my method. First. I mixed the oil paint with a three to one paint to mineral spirits mixture as recommended on a few painting websites. And this helped immensely. Second, I stood further back about 12 to 18 inches back at minimum from the cabinet anytime I was painting it. And this also helped. Uh, I finally increased the spray power a little bit uh, to setting six out of 10, which actually granted me a little more control over the spray, which sounds counterproductive, but uh, it really started looking great. And then every round I painted, I let it dry and then I would wet sand it with progressively finer sandpaper, eventually ending at about a 2000 to 4000 sandpaper with the wet sand. Now overall, I ended up doing this whole dance about six times. So this is a lot of paint on this cabinet, uh, but the end result looked very nice. It had a nice smooth paint job covering about 98% of the damage. Uh, and the repair work. So, you know, there's some spaces where I can kind of still see it through the paint, but I think most people probably wouldn't notice it. Now, in the future, uh, if you're planning on going down this route yourself, I would recommend these things you really should take heed of. First of all, give yourself a break if you're getting a little lightheaded. Even with the ventilator, paint fumes in like a 10 by 10 enclosed space are pretty powerful. So, um, you know, just make sure you're protected with that ventilator. That's super important. Uh, mask everything, mask every part of that game. Be very careful. Every part of that tent where you think there might be a hole because you don't want paint just going everywhere. I used some heavy duty uh, blue painters tape and thick plastic with the cardboard. It worked really well. I had virtually no paint leakage in the actual game painting. Set your paint booth up somewhere where you are comfortable leaving it unattended overnight so you don't risk uh, paint that isn't quite set yet from getting messed up. Oil paint does take a while to dry, uh, especially if it's getting a little cooler outside. And you, you really won't, don't want to do this during the winter. You want to be kind of nice and warm outside. You should never paint when it's raining, so I've been told. Clean out your paint gun as soon as you can after each use. It's kind of a crap job, but take care of your tools and they'll always take care of you. Uh, and always pay for top quality paint. That's pretty uh, important too. Don't ever paint an arcade game with latex paint, by the way, because the decals won't stick and it will peel off. And it may look good initially, but it will look like crap soon after. My canopy kit, although it was cheap, it actually worked great. I don't think for the purposes of a paint booth, you could really ask for a better canopy. So don't feel like you had to spend like $300 on some heavy duty canopy. It's just not worth it. I also use bricks to weigh down the post of the canopy, but they do make these specific little corner weights for the canopy post. And that would have been really nice to have and probably would have been a, a little bit easier to manage. Overall, I, I was extremely satisfied with my cheap and reusable paint booth. It provided a nice working space. I had zero paint leakage outside the booth and it provided the drying paint a great place to 
basically dry and not get particulate or any sort of whatever over it. It also folds up and stores away very neatly. I even used the booth uh, and it was kind of helped by the red splatter inside of it as a booth for Halloween to give out candy in a socially distanced way. Once the spring arrives, I plan on using the booth to re-stencil both my Moon Patrol and my Stargate cabinet and do some work on the Space Harrier. And it seems like I should have no issues using this booth for years to come as long as I'm not super aggressive with it. So overall, it just really worked out well. Okay, so here is our finished product, our Red Donkey Kong. I am pretty satisfied with the way it turned out after our spray booth shenanigans. It's pretty smooth. It's not perfect, but it's uh, like 99% pretty good, right? And this side art is the non-copyrighted version of the side art. I think I get this from the Zavos Arcade. He made this for me. And it's important that the red ones do not have the copyright or the trademark information on these, um, even though this is not, again, if you watch the other one, this is not a radar scope conversion like the very first ones. It's the first run of True Donkey Kong. This is what they call a TKG3 uh, that was coming from the factory as a Donkey Kong originally. And if you look at the front here, um, all the damage that we cleaned up came up pretty well on the front. I need to go in there and sand a little bit of my overspray still, I guess. And the inlets are good. This is an original, no copyright, no trademark marquee which would have had now the bezel and the control panel are reproductions, unfortunately, with the trademark. They look very nice. And I think I got those from Mike's Arcade. And then we redid the laminate little strip here where the control panel instruction sticker sits. That was heavily damaged with cigarette burns. We had to strip it off. It's a, unless you disassemble the entire cabinet, you can't get this piece of wood out. So we re-laminated it. Luckily, we had some leftover black laminate from the uh, Liberator project. And it looks, that turned out great. I, I couldn't believe how great that turned out. So it's pretty much done other than my coin door, which you can see maybe a little bit, it's, it's pretty banged up and rusted. Uh, I need to get it powder coated. Unfortunately, again, the, the COVID situation doesn't allow for that right now. So it's just gonna have to wait. And you notice too, the Donkey Kong is not upstairs with the games. And that's because I am actually not a fan of Donkey Kong, <laughs> and so I think the fate of this game will probably be in someone else's collection. It's a came out beautifully. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better, I think, red Donkey Kong if you wanted one. It's just not really my cup of tea. I actually like Donkey Kong Jr. and Donkey Kong 3 better than the original Donkey Kong. So we'll probably use this one as trade bait for something a little more interesting. But who knows? Who knows? But I got to finish that coin door first. And it is running the original four board set that it should inside. And we can actually take a look at that. I'm not going to be able to see this. Okay, get some of these wheel mover scooters. They will help you immensely. Just look inside here. We have our original instructions. Still uh, pretty amazing. The original Sanyo. Uh, has very, very little burn in this monitor, which is beautiful. And the four board set with the correct bracket. Now I'm missing the guide brackets on the bottom of the PCB that were sitting on that wood. So I just kind of bent the tail so it sits flush. And the original power supply and the black isolation transformer, which is how you can tell it's a real uh, TKG3 version is that black uh, isolation transformer. So yeah, overall, I mean, this game, it just came out great. It's just not the game for me, but it was a fun project. It's just a fun project for someone else to enjoy. Okay, so uh, that's it for the Donkey Kong in the paint booth. All right, so that's it for this time on the Arcade Chronicles. In the upcoming months, we'll have some other projects, I'm sure. I'll do mailbag next time as well. I know a lot of people like that last time. Just kind of ran out of time right now. And I have a big project coming up in the spring, but I'm not really ready to divulge those details yet. So I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying safe, and I hope you have a great holiday. And happy hunting out there. And I'll see you next time. Bye!